Well, good morning, everyone. Today is May 13th, 2021. Uh, thank goodness it's Thursday and not Friday. Um, but uh, I've been working on a project. Actually, it's working on me, I guess I should say, because I've discovered something going on biblically, chasing a few bunnies down these rabbit trails through Scripture. And the deeper I go, the more this comes together. Now, I just did an hour and 36 minute video that started out with the Mark of the Beast and what it possibly could be. Um, so I want you to, as you listen to this, I want you to take everything that I say and test it against the scripture because it's the scripture that is the final authority. Not me, not my viewpoints. Okay, You have to be the judge. You have to deal with this. This is about you and your relationship with God the Father. Okay? But I do want to warn you, what we're about to the, the trail we're about to go down is uh well let's say it this way, it weighs heavy on my heart. Um it's something that I discovered or I was shown or this is one bunny I wish I hadn't chased. But um Nonetheless, we need to know what is going on and what Scripture is trying to reveal to us time after time after time, okay? Because if you go all the way back to the garden, everything started in the garden. And let me lay this out here because this is in another video. I'm not going to go into it. Our sin is not the problem. Okay, the sin is not the enemy. And I say that for this reason. We all sin. We've all done something against the law of God. We do that. It's in our nature. Where does that nature come from? It comes from the original sin back in the garden. See, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, everything was created good. But in the garden with the fall of man, if you want to go read that section, Ask yourself this when you read it. Would Eve or Adam, would they have disobeyed God had the serpent not deceived them? Okay, so the deception in the garden was the issue. The result was the sin and the fall of mankind. So what is the battle? The battle is God's battle against the serpent. And that's what it says in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. So see, that's the battle cry. That's the battle. We are offspring of Adam, the fallen man. You see, and it's the man that carries the seed. Okay, the male part of the reproductive plan. Okay, that's the seed. But this is against the seed of the woman. Okay, that seed of the woman is the prophecy to Christ. So we, being the seed of man, Adam, the promise of Abraham, Abraham's seed, the seed of the promise, we are caught between choosing between which one we want to be. Do we want to follow and become the seed of the woman, be adopted into that? Or do we want to follow and become the seed of of the serpent and follow that. And that is choice. That is what we must choose. That's the battle that we, as the Son of Man, are in. Okay, do you see that? Now that's why Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, that's the prophecy of Him coming in Genesis 3.15. Why? Because He was not born of man. He was born of the Spirit of the seed of the woman. Okay, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that can happen. Yes, he was born in the flesh. He was born a physical being. But he was not born of the seed of Adam or the seed of Abraham. Well, actually he was the seed of Abraham, but not through the male lineage. And that's a whole other issue. But it actually comes through... Let me go there real quick. This is kind of important. When you look at the genealogies in Matthew, and you look at the genealogies in Luke, 
at the Christmas story where it talks about Christ being born. Matthew starts with Joseph and goes backwards to Abraham. And as it does so, when it gets to David, it goes up the lineage to Solomon, to David, and backwards. Okay? When you look at Luke, Luke says the supposed son, Joseph, and he's of a different father. Different Joseph, Jesus' stepdad, if you would, there's two different fathers to him. One is, but one is his father and one is his supposed father. That means son-in-law. Okay? So, yes, it's tracing Joseph, but it's doing something a little different. So when you follow that one back, it doesn't go through Solomon. It goes through Nathan to David. And then from there, it goes all the way back to Adam. That's the importance of those two genealogies because that lineage in Luke is the lineage to Mary. And it goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. That was, bam, aha moment. Okay? Because Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecy of the seed of the woman. Now that right there changes the whole meaning of Scripture. Because no longer is our sin nature the issue. Why? Because through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we are redeemed, our sins are forgiven through Christ, and we are redeemed back to being the sons of God, or the daughters of God. See, Adam was created by God. We were all begotten of Adam. Jesus was begotten of God so that he could be redeemed, redeem the flesh back to God. That's the purpose. So our sin nature is conquered and defeated in Christ. Yes, we have to turn from it. Yes, we have some work to do within ourselves overcoming our fleshly tendencies. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we have to work more toward holiness and understanding. But it's still conquered. We still have the way. That's the path. Okay, We have growth to do. That's called sanctification. That's all well and good. But the real problem is the deception. Just like there was deception in the garden, we have to not be deceived by who Christ is. Because Paul tells us and warns us that there will be many false teachers and false prophets. Paul says they're already in the world. Okay, So a false teacher and a false prophet and a false gospel and a false Christ is not something that's coming in the future. It's something that was there day one. You go right to the book of Acts, where Peter, I think it's chapter, I'm not sure where the chapter is, but Simon Magnus wanted to buy those spiritual gifts from Peter when Peter went there and did that healing. He wanted to buy those gifts. And he said, "May your, I think it's, may your money perish with you. So you can't buy these gifts. And that sets up, that is one, maybe one of the first examples of a false teaching or a false doctrine. So, our goal is, yes, to overcome our sin. We do that through the blood of Christ, and we do that by trying to live more the way He taught us. That's an ongoing process. And the only way we do that is to overcome our deception and understand that the will of God for our life is that we come to the knowledge of who He is. And that the enemy of that is deception trying to show us who we're not. You know? And that is why right now in our world the media and all these groups are against Christ. That's why they're against Christianity because if you come to know the truth the truth will set you free from their mockingbird media campaigns. Do you see that? Deception is the enemy all through scripture and I could spend hours and hours and hours on that actually I have I've spent about 15 years studying this 
and, and, and fleshing this out and working through this. And I'm here to tell you, your sin is not the problem. I'm not saying you don't have it. We all have it. You pick, pick yours. I got mine. Okay? But I'm not going to beat you up over that because that's what Christ come to defeat. The problem is the deception is you don't know who He is, therefore you don't know who you are in Him, therefore you don't know how to overcome the deceptions that are in the world that are keeping you downtrodden. Do you see that? And I say that with as much love and as much respect as I can because this is where we're at. This is where we're at. And today, in this world, I really believe this is choice. Now, am I saying Jesus is going to come tomorrow? No, I'm not going to set a date. But he says, when you see all of these things, then you know the time is short, near, even at the door. Okay? And there, there's a number of things that indicate in the Matthew like in Matthew 24, where it says, people, I believe it's in Matthew 24, people will go to and fro. Uh, people will be able to see the two witnesses that are yet to come um, in Jerusalem. And yeah, things are heating up in Israel, right? But the two witnesses will show up in Jerusalem and the whole world will watch. Well, how will the whole world watch? Because you can go to the Western Wall right now, log on to their cameras, and you can watch live what's going on at the Western Wall. We have that technology now. The whole world will watch these two witnesses. And that's just, that in itself is amazing. The technology is what has brought it together under a world system. So, the battle is control of the world system. Okay, so if we go, and we're going to do this here in Revelations, and we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to touch on it and then go back over it. When it says, when it talks about in Daniel, it talks about the kingdoms of Nebuchadnezzar, that's in Daniel 9. It reiterates them in Revelation, where it talks about where John is, so it would have been in 90 AD, we were written during the time of the Roman Empire. It says five kingdoms have fallen, and one is. Well, the five that are fallen you can see in Daniel, where you've got uh, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, uh, Greek. Rome, and I'm leaving one out. Um, I'm leaving one out. Um, and then one is to come. Okay, then, one, then there's one is. Five have fallen and one is. That's six. And then one is to come, but he must continue but a short space. And I found something interesting right there. Um, and then it talks about the eighth kingdom, the world kingdom, is of the seventh. I want to bring something out on that here in just a minute uh, that you're going to see that's going to be incredible. This may be a long video, so what I recommend that you do is I'm going to hit some, give you some transitions. I'm going to do it as one because I don't want to stop my train of thought, but if you need to hit the pause button, I'm going to give you some breaks in the middle telling you when uh, would be a good time to, to break. So with that, we're going to look at the mark of the beast as it talks about in Scripture, and that the mark of the beast is used to deceive the nations. Okay, that's what we have to understand. So let's go back to my notes. Let's get into that. And I uh, want to warn you here. When we get into this, you're about to experience what is called a paradigm shift. I know I did. And what that simply means is you have a certain way of thinking, and then when you get some new evidence, it changes the way you think. So expect that. You're going to meet this with resistance. I get it. I did. Um, it's heavy on my heart, but I can't find any, you know, am I saying, thus saith the Lord? No. But am I watching this? Most definitely. So a paradigm, for example, the world is flat. Remember we used to have that theory that the world was flat and all that and now we went moved over to the well no the earth revolves around the sun it's a heliocentric the sun's the center of the universe not the earth and the earth revolves around the sun that was changed that way of thinking is a paradigm shift now as crazy as this sounds there are many people that are going back to the flat earth theory 
and they're using biblical examples to prove that. And that's kind of, it's, I'm not going to say it is or it isn't. They make some good claims, but it just doesn't hold water to me. And that's not here what I'm talking about, so that's, that's completely something else. Okay, so expect a paradigm shift. Expect resistance of what I'm getting ready to tell you. Okay, current paradigm of this, at least from my perspective where I started studying Scripture and what I grew up with, is that most Christians are waiting on this Antichrist person to appear. Okay? Or to be... Here's the kicker. It's not to appear. It's to be revealed. So that doesn't mean he hasn't come yet. It just means we don't understand who he is yet. This may be what I'm talking about. This is the paradigm. Okay? So they're waiting for some future event. You know? Now, it, it, and a part of that is the head wound, who had a deadly head wound and it was healed, or he was wounded by the sword and did live. Okay? We're going to talk about those um, when we get there. So they're waiting to get see somebody get a deadly head wound and then come back to life, and we get to go, oh, there's the Antichrist. I don't think so. He that had a head wound and did live, remember, Christ said, or Genesis 3.15 says, He will crush your head. So Christ is going to crush the head of the Antichrist. But guess what? He did live. And Jesus, this is tough right here, our Jesus, our Messiah, had a wound by the sword, and he did live. Wow. And actually, that just rolled into here because I was, I was actually reading that as we were talking. So, be careful here. This is the paradigm shift. I am not de denying our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Okay? He was born of the Virgin. He was crucified on the cross. He was laid in a tomb. And he was resurrected by God the Father, the first fruits of the resurrection of the flesh. That is the way. That is the truth. That is our life. Not denying that at all. I'm trying to point out a false system. And that false system, remember, we're dealing with deception. So it's going to be made to look like Christ. You see my point? That's the scary part. That's what we have to dig out. Okay. This is the paradigm shift. Okay, this is also a wake-up call to all of us. One more disclaimer, and I've said this already, you must seek this out for yourself. You must test everything I say against the Scripture. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what Scripture says and your relationship with God and your relationship to the Scripture. Okay. So, First thing, before I get into Revelation 13, another paradigm for many of those who are pre-tribulation, pre-trib people with that pre-trib understanding is we go to, most of that understanding comes from Revelation 4. I want to go all the way back to Revelation 4 real quick because I need to show you this. I need to lay some groundwork. Most of Revelation 4, they use this phrase right here, come up hither, as being when the church or the true believers are taken up. Okay? I don't follow that anymore. I used to, but I don't see that. Because it says right there in John, this is Jesus, this is Jesus dealing with John. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. Okay, so there's a trumpet with me, not the church, with me, and said, Come up hither, and I will show you these things which must, must be hereafter. So he's beginning to show John the things that are coming. Okay, so most traditional belief, Christian, Protestant belief, is that a pre-tribulation belief, is that that's the rapture of the church. So all of these things from here forward take place after the church is gone. 
Okay. And that's where you have the 24 elders and, and we get into all that. I'm not going to dig into all that right now. Okay. So John sees, this is important, John sees, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a rat loud voice who was worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look thereon. Okay, so we're going if we're taking this part and going in a chronological order, how can the church be gone if no one was found worthy to open the seals? You see my point. The church can't be gone there. Okay? And then one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So right there is when Jesus prevails. You see my point. That is the resurrection and actually would be the ascension, uh, which would be the day of Pentecost when Christ ascended into heaven. That's when he that final prevailing happened. Because we do know that Jesus walked after the resurrection. He was seen in his spirit body by the apostles and by those along with 500 other 500 or so other people, uh, resurrected people. That's the first resurrection. That's the first fruits. So we clearly see here that Jesus is just now found worthy. Okay, he's, he's prevailed. He's done it. And I behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having the seven heads, excuse me, seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth to all the earth. So now the seven spirits, the seven horns and the seven eyes, can be sent to the people of God. This is that Holy Spirit that we see in Acts 2 being given to the people. Okay, Jesus has prevailed. This is what protects us, that calling of the Holy Spirit, protects us from the deception of the world. Okay? This is the battle. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, and the golden vials full of the odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred tongue, people, and nation. So we see that this Holy Spirit, this prevailing of Christ, is going where? It's going out to all the nations. Okay, that's why the disciples were told to go to all the nations, preach the gospel to all the world. This is the other side of that coin. Okay, this is the other side of that battle. And it says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands, and thousands of thousands, okay? Kind of unlimited here. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. So worthy is Christ. And Christ gives us the commission to begin to fulfill that here on earth. Okay? I'm getting to the deception. God, there's so much there's so much groundwork here. And every creature which is in heaven, every creature, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such that are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power. Be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. I'm going to give you a little aside here. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power. The animals, every creature knows what happened. I want to give you something. This, this is just an observation. Have you ever seen somebody that dogs just don't like? Have you ever witnessed that? 
our animals know the Spirit of God. This is, like I said, this is an aside. I love animals. They're God's creatures. And my sister, I'm going to use her as an example, she tamed a feral cat. We had cats running around the neighborhood when we were kids. And she actually tamed a feral cat. Ended up having kittens. Ended up keeping the, some of the kittens. You know, this was in the 70s, I guess. But the thing of it is, is that's the way Adam was in the garden. That spirit was connected. But yet some people just don't like animals. You know, we have chickens now. And I can go in there and pet these little chickens. They climb up on my shoulder. They do these things. And I don't know. But some people don't like animals. Some people don't have that connection with animals. That's just me. You do the same thing. But I love my creatures. Yes, I'm not. No, I'm not a vegetarian. Yes, I eat meat. I'll be happy for the day when I don't. When this body doesn't have to. You know, in the Garden of Eden, it was all the herbs. The all the herbs were for food and for medicine. There was no death. There was no eating of meat. Okay, but when we stepped off the boat with Noah, all of the animals were for food and for meat. I don't like it. That's our condition, but it's not our condition in our resurrected bodies when we no longer have to do that. I get it. If you want to be, if you feel led to be a vegetarian or vegan, I'm all for it. Okay, I know I digressed, but I just want to show you that there is a connection there. That the animals know who God is. Probably better than we do. Okay, and the four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him and lived forever. Now, the seven seals. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of the thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So, the first thing Jesus does, or the first thing that happens with these seals, is if the church is already in heaven, why do we have an Antichrist spirit going out into the world? See my point? But in order for there to be a battle, which is what this is, conquering and to conquer, there has to be two sides. You now have a conquering Christ, and you have an Antichrist, and they're going out to battle. What is the battle? The battle is Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thy seed and the seed of the woman. This is your choice. This is your battle. This, what we're getting ready to get into, is the plan of the deception that the Antichrist will use throughout the battle. And you're like, Kevin, this is totally off. And I get it. But we're not there yet. Okay. So, and I can prove that because this word bow, right here, and I've done a full study on this, but I've got to show you this because we've got to put all this together. This word bow, right here, comes from the word that is the word taxon. Okay, from the base of the word a bow, which means a simple fabric. Okay. The dude, this dude, this Antichrist dude's got a bow in his hair. Okay? We're going to look at something else. The word bow here, it does not mean a bow like a bow and arrow. I was always taught growing up, well, this Antichrist has got a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows, so he's harmless. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, it's not even scriptural when you look at the meaning of the words. So it means a simple fabric, but notice it says it's from the base of G5088. That's the Greek word. Okay, 5088. So I'm going to show you how to do something here. Go to your dictionary. Go to search. We're going to type in the word bow. Oops. Okay. 
Okay, the word bow, and it said from 5088. Okay, so these are all the different things. So G. G5115, okay. G. Hello. There it is, G5115. Sorry. Couldn't get my numbers right. Okay. So we're back to this. This is this is this abbreviation from the base of 5088, a bow, apparently a simple fabric. But when you look at this word, it says it's a strengthened form of the word tico. Okay? Which used only as an alternate in certain tenses, which means to produce from seed as a mother plant, either literal or figurative, to bear, to be born, to bring forth, to be delivered, to be in travail. This is the beginning of the seed war. See, before Christ, people were kept by the law. Okay? you got to be in this box. you got to be kept by the law. Christ is the end of the law for salvation. Now we're dealing with the seed war. Okay. Yes, the law does play a part still. That is still our sounding board. Without understanding that, we can end up with a false Christ, which is the deception. So we have to be able to put the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophesies of the New Testament. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We have to be able to put those together to get a complete picture of the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. If not, we can go off on a tangent. That's why within Christianity alone, I think there's something more than 30,000 different denominations. Those are all religious denominations under the name of Christianity. Okay, so that's what I want to show you with the word bow. So this is the beginning of the seed war. Okay, and I saw and he beheld a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So this Antichrist figure is going out to conquer the world. While at the same time, Christ has prevailed to make the way. So now we have a Christ-Antichrist battle. Okay, You can't have an Antichrist battle until you have Christ. So the first thing that Christ, or that happens, is the Antichrist spirit is released, as well as the Holy Spirit that happens in Acts, uh, when when God bring when Jesus is after He's resurrected, He sends forth the Comforter. Okay, this is the battle. This is the battle that you're in. When He'd opened the second seal, turn this off. And when He'd opened the second seal, I heard the second beast come and say, "Come and see." And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword so we see right now that we have peace being taken from the earth now Jesus said says I have not come to bring peace but a sword okay that sword is designed to help us and take us and separate us from the world Jesus says, if you love the world more than you love the Father, the love of the Father is not in you. See the division that's happening. The sword of truth separates us from the deception of the world. And that's just all through Scripture. Okay, And this is why we, in our minds, that this is what's going on. This is the separation of the sheep and the goats. This is the picking of the deciding of times. And we're going to get into the market here in just a minute. So, there's a whole Christian religion out there, or ideology, that we have to bring peace upon the earth so that Christ can come back. No, the world's going to hell in a hen basket until Christ comes back. Okay, so yes, within ourselves and within our loved ones, we need to be sharing the gospel. But that gospel is to is the gospel of Christ designed to separate us from the world. Not to create a world that's peace. Because if you look like the world, you're, do, you're be careful of following a false religion or a false Christ. That's how dangerous this deception is. And you have to figure it out for yourself. So here we have peace, war, those types of things. 
And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and lo, a black horse, and he that set him had a pair of balances in his hand. Well, balances can mean a couple of things. Balances are used in judgment. You know, we have Lady Liberty that stands there, you know, has the blindfold on, he holds the balances. Okay, is that justice? Is that judgment? Uh, is that being weighed in the balances? Okay, and there's a scripture that says we've been found weighed in the balances when we've been found wanting. Okay, there's more to this. Balances are also used uh, to determine weights and measures, uh, whether that be economic balances or things like that. Okay, so that can be that's this next thing that's coming. And I heard in the midst of the four beast say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and a measure of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The oil and wine thing I still struggle with. I haven't put my finger on that yet. I've got some thoughts, but I can't really confirm them even with my own heart. But a measure of wheat for a penny, and a measure of barley for a penny. That's famine. Okay? That's economic turmoil that's you know just like we saw recently the gas prices you know the gas shortages famines pestilences all of these things okay these are the weapons of warfare of the battle that we're in okay and then the oil and the wine we're not going this is my thought you have to dig it out for yourself but oil and wine are the rich man's desires, rich man's pleasures. So we're not going to mess with that. Okay? That's what I see. I cannot confirm. When he'd opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice and a fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, which we saw above, with hunger, which we saw above, and with death, which we saw here, and with the beast of the earth. So let me tell you, ask you this right now. What do people fear? Many people on the earth, at least a fourth part, okay, sword, violence, bloodshed, okay, they're afraid for their peace and safety. We have gun violence. We have, you know, violence in the streets. We have looting. We have fires. We have all of these things. Killed with a sword. We have war itself. Um, you know, that takes peace from our earth. All of those types of things. People are fearful of going hungry. You know, we've got people starving here and people starving there. And though that may be true, that is still a mechanism of control. One of our wonderful leaders actually was caught on, on in one of her speeches saying food is a weapon. Nothing can be any more clearer than this right here. If food is a weapon, we have weaponized hunger. Boom. End of story. And he's going to kill them with death. Fear of death. Fear of dying. Fear of this world ending. I got news for you. This life, this body is going nowhere. This corruptible body must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. When we know that we have within us the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise of His salvation, we know that eternity is ours. Our treasures are in heaven. Jesus said Himself, My kingdom is not of this world. Okay? We are to talk about His kingdom. We are to do on earth as it is in heaven. But this earth still has to be cleansed by the power of Jesus. The earth itself will be resurrected. The earth itself will be returned to the glory of God. As it was created to be in Genesis 1, it will be returned to that in Revelation 21 and 22. And we'll look at that hopefully by the end of this. This is what's going to be a nine-hour video. Okay, so, so now we're up to hunger, death, fear of death, okay? and with the beast of the earth.
we're going to be killed, have fear of death by the beast of the earth. Okay, today is May 13th, 2021. They just released in Florida these genetically modified mosquitoes. What's going to be the end result of that? <coughs> Excuse me. What's going to be the end result of that? If you the, the the design of this, according to the articles, is the mosquito supposed to mate with the female mosquito, and those offspring will not be fertile. They will not be able to reproduce. Okay, so what happens if this male mosquito bites or infects a human, or bites or infects a dog, or bites or infects whatever? Is that material going to be transmitted? Is there going to be some type of repercussion there? We don't know. It's an experiment. It's a genetic experiment, as it was in Genesis 6. All flesh had corrupted itself. Okay? Now, let's take that also and look at bats. We have a virus that supposedly came from bats, the beast of the field. Okay? I'm in Revelation 6, 8. Well, let me clarify something for you here, just real quick. If we go back to Genesis 9, let me show you where this comes from. Genesis chapter 9, I believe it is. Be fruitful and multiply. Noah, as he comes off the boat, God blesses them and says, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. So it's kind of a God starting all over again, as he did in Genesis 1, but with a few things. Okay, so, and every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even, even as the green herb I have given you all things. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood, thou shalt not eat. Okay, so the blood is one thing we don't want to get into. Okay, and surely your blood of your lives, surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast. Will I require it? And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. And whoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God created he man. This is very, very important right here. This is this new beginning of mankind after the flood. But God created man in his image. That is Genesis 1 and 2. That image was destroyed in Genesis 3 by the deception of what God created by the deception of the serpent. This is why, right here, God still says, we will die. And this is how we will die. And this is what is talked about in Revelation. Do you see that? It's nothing. It's nothing any different from the boat to the moat. Okay? But Jesus brought us the immortality. Jesus brought us salvation. Jesus brought us the way out of this paradigm. Whoever so sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. God created Adam in his image. Adam fell to become that image of man. And all of mankind on this earth is begotten, not created, is begotten after the image of Adam. Jesus comes begotten, not by the seed of man, not by the will of man, but by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God Himself, through Mary, so that he is begotten of the flesh, as man is begotten of the flesh. But not through the seed of the man, through the seed of the woman. So that through death, burial, and resurrection, we can be redeemed out of this plight. You see, that's the big picture. That's the whole picture. The problem is, we're in a battle. We're in a battle between choosing to, be, to follow the seed of the woman or to follow the seed of the serpent, which is the deception of the world. Do you see the big picture? So now we got to figure out, well, what is that? 
And it's the Bible that tells us. It's scripture that reveals all of this to us. And at some point in time, we're going to take a mark that seals us. That's our choice. God says, do not hurt the earth until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. That forehead is our knowledge. That forehead is our mind. That forehead is understanding. That forehead is our choice. God says, my people shall hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. The sheep know the voice of their master. You will choose. You will choose. We all are right here at Genesis 9-5. This mortality is done for. This body is not leaving this earth. I love you because you are more than flesh and blood. You are spirit. You are the Shekinah glory of God that is given to you through the Holy Spirit. That's where that goes. And we will meet him in the air and we will get new bodies. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. So don't let this scare you. Don't let death, as it is mentioned here, scare you because that is a control mechanism of the beast system. Do you not see that's what's going on in our world? Fear death. That's why Jesus says, he who shall save his life will lose it. And he who will choose to lose his life will save it. That's where that comes from. That's the end game. Okay. I'm digressing here quite a bit, but all of this is a puzzle. It's a puzzle. Okay. If you want to take a break, right here is a good chance because I want to go back to Revelation 13 and 14. So if that was a bit much for you, pause. Um, use this section right here. I'm going to hit the pause button here. I'm going to go get a drink, and I will be right back. Okay, we are back. Thank you for that little break right there. I had to go get a cup of coffee. Got my little boy right there on playing baseball. I hope you're having some aha moments. I hope you're having some wow moments. That's what this meant to me. Um, and I've got other teachings in here that fill in the gaps. I'm kind of giving you the big picture, but when we look at the Seed of the Woman video series, I follow that all through Scripture. When I look at the light of Genesis 1, I can follow that all through Scripture. Um, so there's a lot more to this. I'm just trying to give you the overall picture of the end game, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and how this scripturally, this is a story of mankind. So let's get back to it. I finished up with... Genesis or 9, and we were on Revelation. Uh, we were going through the horsemen here just real quick. So let me go back to that. And uh, I do this on the fly, so you are watching me live. And that was Genesis 6, I believe, the seven seals. Okay, now, and when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw, okay, here we go. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, this is where we finished off, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. Okay? Um, come and see him. So, Death and Hell. That's the end game. That's Satan's plan for you. According to Scripture, death and hell and power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth and that's what we just talked about we know that that is the plan of the antichrist and that that is mentioned in scripture back in in 9 back in genesis 9 so god is telling noah there's no way out. There's no way out. 
the only way out of this earthly existence is through the blood of Christ through our new bodies through our new immortality through our new resurrection and when you understand that when you understand that everyone around you is in the same boat the boat that Noah got off of <laughs> then we're not a respecter of person God sent this information to every nation every tongue every tribe there is no racism in Christ in Christianity don't let the world tell you that that's part of the deception that's why they want the Bible cut out because if you cut out the truth then they can no longer use it against you duh you see my point they're using ignorance of scripture against the people who should know scripture and that's why this happens and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them which were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held this testimony right here exposing their end game the revelation of who Christ is that's what this is I'm exposing their plan this is what I have waiting for me you know on one of my Facebook posts or YouTube or whatever where I was talking the other day somebody put up a little video and they had a computer voice you know with a little cartoon character and they're trying to explain something and I posted on there it says you know cartoon characters do not and a computer voice do not give you much credibility well some people have to do that for safety reasons folks did you just see what I said when peace and safety are used against you to keep you from voicing your opinion then you're not going to be under the altar slain for the word of God that's a gut check that's a check up from the neck up that's exactly what that is where are you sealed what are your expectations what's coming if you fear what's coming if you fear the hunger if you fear the death if you fear these things then you're going to be controlled by that and I can also show you that using Maslow's hierarchy of our the psychology of what's going on this is the manipulation of the world so the fifth seal saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth so uh, in accordance to what we were taught I was taught earlier as a kid that the church is gone in Revelation 4 when it says come up hither well how can those who are slain be under the altar who are slain for the word of God during this portion this is happening now the church is still here people Christians are being killed in missionary fields all over the world being slain for the word of God right here right now this is live you see my point so it's not some future event where well we don't the church we don't have to worry about the Antichrist because we're not gonna be here when he comes folks he's been here since day one he's been here since the resurrection of Christ and it has been a deception since the beginning that's what the church has to wake up and see okay that's why the book of Revelation starts out with the letters to the seven churches because they're being deceived at that moment not in the future okay now yes that is a prophetic future of what happens with the churches I can say that 
because the Bible is cyclical. It's the same thing from the beginning to the end. It's one pattern, of, and it's repeated over and over and over again. That's why we say history repeats itself. Yes, until the last time. Okay? It's one game plan. Okay, I'm digressing. Woo! Got a little hot. And so they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto each of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Folks, that's the church age. This is the mission of the church, to separate people, to inform people and separate them from the deception of the world into the love of God. That's the battle. That's the battlefield. That's Genesis 3.15. This is the battle. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal. Now this is kicker. When he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And what? And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And who? The kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. When those heavens are departed, and that scroll is opened, we go up, he comes down. That is where the church is taken out. This is, this is the beginning of that process. And at least the describing of this process. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? But see, we're not appointed unto the wrath of the Lamb. We're not appointed unto that. Jesus, the Lamb, comes to save us. So we're gone. That's where we go. That is where those who are under the throne are redeemed. And those who remain and who are on the earth when this happens, we will meet him in the air. So those who are dead in Christ, we will not prevent them from leaving. This is called the harpazo, the catching together, the calling away. Okay? That is your battle. This is the end of the battle. For the church, for the true believers, not for the false church. Okay? There will be those who are left behind. And how do we know that? Because that is in Matthew 7. And this is what scared me to death. Judging others, judge not that ye be not judged. Okay? If we judge others, and this is a fine line, remember what I was saying earlier, when we sit back and look, at mankind and we know that we're in a pitiful condition okay based on what we were meant to be how we were created to be in the garden and how we're going to be redeemed to be in the end when we look at others we just tell them what a poor sinner they are and they're going to hell and blah 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 that spirit of condemnation will keep them from the truth of who God really is okay and not only that for that judgment that you're giving out of your mouth, you're being judged yourself. You are being judged. We are being judged. And we live ourselves under a spirit of condemnation. So whatever we dish out is going to come back to us. But when we look at the whole of the world and realize we're all in the crapper, and it's only Jesus that's going to save us, then I can look at those who are in a... Okay, maybe a worse state than what I would be. You know, those who may be battling drug addictions, those who may be battling, you know, not knowing who they are in Christ, this identity crisis, you know, 
Tell me there's not an identity crisis what we're dealing with right now. The whole transgender movement. You know, you can love them, love your enemy. That is an enemy. That is an abomination. But you can also share with them the love of Christ to show them that's not who you're designed to be. So that's where this judge others comes in. And that's a whole other teaching as well. But you've got to be able to, thou hypocrite, cast out the beam in your own eye. And then you shall see clearly to cast out the moat in thy brother's eye. Okay? That means if you don't understand how you're saved and how Jesus saved you and how you are living in a sinful body until you receive the Holy Spirit and that you're in a battle, you're not going to understand that your brother's in a battle too. And if, and if you're just condemning them and not showing them the battle that they're in, you're not going to be of any effect. You're going to be looked at as a hypocrite. Okay, so ask and it will be given. What does that mean? If you seek, you shall find. If you knock, it shall be opened. For everyone that asketh to receive it, and he seeketh and find it. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If you want to see what I'm trying to show you, if you're having trouble understanding it, and you want to see it, if you want to test it, you have to go to God. That's asking for those eyes to see and those ears to hear and that heart to understand with. That's what that means. You have to make the decision. You can't sit here and judge me and go, I don't know if he's right or not. You won't. You won't. And that's the parable of the sower to whether it's received into the good earth or whether it's received into a stony heart or whether the birds of the air and the fowl come and pluck it away. Um, there's a whole picture of that. So you have to make the decision. And I know I'm being preachy, and I'm sorry, but this is where we're at. So if a man, if there's a man of you would ask a son for bread, would he give him a stone? If you're asking to seek the truth from the bottom of your heart, is God going to give you a stone, a heart of stone? Is he going to, to say no? If you're seeking his voice, if you're the sheep that's seeking his voice, that's what it's about. Seek. But if we, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto our children, okay, how much shall your Father, which is in heaven, give a good gift, give good things to them who ask? He will bring this revelation to you. Then we have the golden golden rule: do unto others, okay. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law of the prophets. Treat somebody like you would want to be treated. Okay? Respect somebody like you would want to be respected. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that lead to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. So broad is the way. You ever heard anybody say, well, all religions lead to the same God? That is absolutely true. They lead, religion leads to the God of this world. And the God of this world currently is the serpent, the garden of deception. See, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. The religions of the world are not of Christ. The religions. Okay, That is what you'll hear me talk about later when I talk about a religious worldview. A secular worldview, a religious worldview, and a supernatural biblical worldview. You must be separated from the world. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. You see that? And a tree is known by its fruit. This is how you tell it. Does what does the tree, does your fruit, does or does the fruit of what I'm saying line up with scripture, or does the fruit of what someone else is saying, does it line up with scripture? How do you know the truth? Well, if you want to be a Bible believing thing, you have to compare the result, the fruit of what's being said, with the scripture. 
if the fruit of this uh, of a, say a Christian teaching that all religions lead to the same God, is that what Scripture says? That's how you check the fruit. That's how you judge. That's how you judge yourself. Judge your own belief against the Scripture. And that's a lifelong process. And what's the thing? Beware of false prophets. Jesus himself in Matthew is already speaking of false prophets. So why are we as a church waiting for the Antichrist to show up? Or waiting for false teachers to show up? They're already here. See? They're, they're right here. And which come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly are ravening wolves. Okay? Revelation says he'll speak as a lamb. He'll look like a lamb, but he'll speak as a dragon. Okay? It'll look like the Lamb of God, the Christ, the Christianity, but it's actually going to be a dragon. That's how deceptive this is. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Okay? It can't be an evil, a good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And what is the judge? The scripture. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Done away with. False Christianity will be done with. Wherefore, by their fruit ye shall know them. And we check the fruit against the scripture. Now here's the verse. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Okay. Who is he talking to? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the fact that you go around professing Jesus, 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 Lord, Lord, is that it? Is, is that the common salvation? All you got to do is say a simple little sinner's prayer and ask God into your life and, whoo, I'm saved, whoo, got my, got my get out of jail free card. Is that what it's saying? Matthew 22 says, many will say to me in that day, what day? The day we just looked at. That day of the Lord, the wrath of the Lamb. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name have we not done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Those are the people professing to know Christ who are following a false Christianity, who are following a false prophet, who are following false apostles, who are following the religion of the world labeled as Christianity but have no truth in them. Jesus tells the Pharisees, My people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Bingo! That's the connection to what this is saying. They're honoring with their lips. Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things in your name? But their hearts are far from them. They don't know God. That's the danger of religion. So just because you go to church on Sunday and stick your butt in a pew, sing a few songs and praise Jesus, and they go out and live like the world the rest of the time, you may have a false conversion. And it is up to you to judge that. What is your fruit? Does your fruit line up to Scripture? Does your way of thinking line up with Scripture? This is hard. This is a gut check. This gut checked me about 15 years ago. Okay? I'm no different than you. I may be further along down the road, but I'm no different. This is this is this is hard. So it says, build your house on the rock. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and do them, 
I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. So, when all those tribulations come, that we saw over in the book of Revelation, when all of those things come against it, the house that was built upon the truth, upon the rock, stood. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and do them shall not be likened unto the foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, tribulation came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Now I want to back up here and I want to look at this rock. This rock is very important. What is the rock? The church is considered the rock. Jesus is considered the rock. The church is built upon the rock. But a lot of the church is built upon the foundation of Peter. That Peter is the rock. And Peter, Peter's name, Petros, that does mean rock in Greek. I get that. But you got to look at the story of what happened right there. And that is what we're going to look at right now. Bible search. And that phrase is upon this rock. On the top of, oh, that's interesting. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh of thy unleavened cakes and lay it upon the rock and pour out the broth. Okay. The altar. But this is where we're going. Matthew 16. Sometimes you can find prophetic prophetic verses that, that connect uh, when you do that. So, Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. Okay, that's the headline for this. So, here's the story. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's our first question. Who do you say that Christ is? Who do I say that Christ is? Are we following a true Christ? Are we following a false Christ? Are we following a religion of the world? Who is it? What is in your heart, not on your lips? And they said, well, some say thou art John the Baptist, and some say Elias, and some say others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Okay. So man didn't really know who Jesus was. Well, he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Who do you say that I am? And he's speaking to his disciples at the time. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Two very important things right there. Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember I said earlier, Jesus Christ was conceived in Mary by the Father, by the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God. Here's going to be a tough one. There are many traditions out there that try to say, and this is that Trinitarian view that Jesus was God. Okay. Jesus was not God. He's the Son of God. Yet, just like Adam, he was filled with the very essence of God. Okay. That's where there's a confusion that lies out there. Okay. Because it's very important to understand Jesus as the Son. Because our purpose is to be redeemed as the Son. Okay? We are to be like Jesus. We are to be like the Son. S-O-N. This is very, very important. Why is that? Because Satan himself says, I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne above God. I will ascend up. I will be like the Most High. If we, if Jesus is our 
role model, is our picture, is our goal that we're to achieve. Okay? If we're to be like Jesus, then we're to be like the Son of the living God. If Jesus is God, then we're making ourselves God. Think about that. Are we trying to make ourselves God? We're created in the image of God. We are God. No, Adam was created in the image of God. And Jesus was begotten from the Spirit of God in the image of God, in the fleshly body, but in the image of God, begotten. That's why he's the only begotten Son of God. You see, that's the adoption, that's the redemption, that's the process. So that when we receive Him, then we become the sons of God. That's why Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. There is a separation between the two. Yes, He is filled with the very essence of Christ. So, in that sense, you know, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, you the spit in the image of your daddy, boy. You know, have you ever heard that? That's what we say down here in the South. You're just like your dad. That's what that means. It doesn't mean he is God. It means he's like his dad. Because Jesus says, I can do nothing without the Father. See, that's a very fine line. I get it. But it's, and it's very deceptive. But it's the it's the line that's drawn right here. Okay? Because Simon says, You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And that's why Jesus says all through Scripture, worship the Father. Worship the Father. Worship God. Jesus never says, Worship me. Nowhere. Does Jesus say, worship me? As a matter of fact, there's many pictures throughout Scripture where the angel of the Lord, uh, like John, for example, you know, he sees the angel of the Lord, which we believe to be Jesus, and he, you know, he bows down to him and he says, he's I'm paraphrasing, he says, See thou doeth not worship God. Revelation tells us those who have the testimony of Jesus. It, that, that's where it says, worship God. For those who have the testimony of Jesus, that is the spirit of prophecy. And that's what we're doing here. We're looking at prophecy. We're looking how the story unfolds. But I'm digressing just a little bit. But Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That is the rock. The revelation of who Christ is was given to him by the Father in heaven, not by flesh and blood. You see that? So the very fact that you're listening to this, I'm flesh and blood. But it's the Spirit behind these words that's being revealed to you through the Holy Spirit you know, if you're asking God for a, for a stone, or if you're asking God for help, if you're asking God for understanding, here it come by the Word of God and by understanding. It's a, it's that cyclical process. And there's scripture in there, and I wasn't going to pull these up, but Jesus says, "No man comes to me unless the Father draws him." Jesus also says, no man goes to the Father unless he comes through me. So it's a closed loop. And it's the Word of God and the Spirit of God that gets in there that puts you on that path to discovering all of that. So this is the rock. The rock is the fact that the Father, the Spirit of God, reveals who Jesus is, and that He is the Son, the only begotten Son of God. 
Adam was created by God, a son of God. We see that when we get back to the lineages, it clearly says, and Adam who was the son of God. So Adam is a son of God. Jesus is a begotten son of God. We, through Jesus, are begotten of the Spirit. Therefore, we become the sons and daughters of God. That's how it works. And all of our sins are wiped away because we and our flesh can't keep from it. We're born under that condemnation of original sin. Do you see this? And all of this is the battle for your soul. Okay. Now look at what happens here. Look at what happens here. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the gates of hell, the deceptions of hell, the deceptions of the world, all of these fiery things that we've talked about, you know, the house comes against it when tribulations come, shall not prevail because you'll have the truth of the Holy Spirit within your soul that you'll be able to test and say, ah, don't think so, Satan. That's not what the Word says. You will not fall victim. And he says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he charged his disciples, and he charged he his disciples, that they should tell no man that he was the Christ. Not yet. Christ hasn't gone up. Christ hasn't, we haven't received that Holy Spirit. So he's foretelling in the next section his death, burial, and resurrection. He's telling how it happens. So when you receive Christ, you're going to receive the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And I've got a whole teaching on that. Because what is it? You're a new creature. You're a new person. You're a, you have a new identity. You understand that your world, that Jesus' kingdom, is not of this world. Your kingdom is not of this world. We're living for something better that is to come. And you will be able to withstand the slings and arrows, the trials and tribulations, the floods, the famines, the things that are coming, and you won't be moved by them. Why? Because you know that's the plan of the enemy. That's the revelation of who Christ is. This is also the revelation of the Antichrist. Why? Because you now know the difference. You now get to choose. So the fact that you're waiting for the Antichrist to be revealed, today is your day. The man of sin has just been revealed. And the man of salvation, Christ, has just been revealed. Which one is going to stand in your heart? See, the third temple is us. Jesus said, I'll tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Okay? That's the third temple. The third temple is in Christ. Now, will there be a fulfillment of the third temple during the tribulation period? Probably so. That's a whole other topic, but probably so. Why? Because that's where the false temple has to be. That's where the Antichrist is going to set himself up as Christ. Why? Because the church is gone. The true church is gone. There's nothing left but the other side. You see how that works? And it says, and it says in the end times when the Spirit of the Lord will be heard no more in thee. The Spirit of the Bridegroom will be heard no more in thee. Okay? That's going to be the deception. You're either going to see it or you're not. I know that's hard. I know that's hard. Okay. So. That's where we're at there. Now, this may be another good time to take a short pause um, because we're going to come back and we're going to dive into Revelation 13. We've already seen Revelation 6, that church age, that how that is put together, uh, the, the wiles, the things that come against us. And again, we see them right here in Matthew. He's saying you're going to build your house upon the rock because these things are coming. And are you going to be able to stand, and you're going to have to stand on the blood of Christ, knowing that when you do, you may be under the altar, 
Okay, you may be one of those under the altar in Revelation five during that trumpet. Okay, so that's where the church says come up hither. Now, okay, so let's take a short break, and uh, we will be back with the third part of this. Okay, lovely people, welcome back. I know this has been difficult. I hope you're still with me. Um, you know, I wish I could sound more exciting. I wish I could pick this up a little bit. I wish I could keep your attention. But honestly, this is it's difficult material. It's not tickling your ears, okay? It's not going to church and sitting in the pews and singing a few songs and praising worship. Nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with those things. We need those things. We need people. We need church. But we need the truth. Okay? Paul says, If I have all truth, but have not love, I'm nothing but a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. La, 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 la. People aren't going to listen to it. Okay? So if you speak all truth, but don't have love, you're not going to get through to people. And that's my challenge. But at the same time, if you speak all love without truth, that's deception. Right? Truth without love is not going to be heard. And love without truth is going to deceive you. And that's where we're at in our world. Test everything. Like I said, well, I have been around and around and around, but now we're going to get into some nitty-gritty, and this is a, the this third part. We're going to be looking at possibly this false image. This is going to upset your apple cart, especially if you are already a believing Christian. Okay, Revelation 13, 4 tells us the plan of the enemy. Okay, excuse me. Okay. And this is the second beast. Okay? There is a first beast. Okay? And let's go on up. This is the first beast. And he stood upon the sands of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Okay? We looked at that earlier. We had ten horns and ten eyes, which were the spirits. So this could be a false beast. And upon his head the name of blasphemy. Okay? So this beast is a blasphemy. It's things that's against the word of God. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So we get to get the power from the dragon which we know Satan to be the dragon uh, the serpent from the garden that's reference to the dragon and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast so we have the people now this is after the church is gone you can see part of this before the church is gone one of his heads was wounded to death, and all the world wandered after the beast. So this is that head wound everybody's looking for. Somebody's going to be looking for somebody to get shot or to get killed, have a head wound, and this person will be healed. Now, here's a possibility. I can't say, thus saith the Lord, on this statement right here. But one of the things that's going on with the transhumanism movement, remember, let me back up, remember, Satan in the garden, he received dominion over the earth. But here's one thing Satan can't do. All mankind will die. We've seen that already. We've talked about that in part two with Noah. All of this physical body must die. So in order for Satan to live, <clears throat> he has to become immortal. He has to learn how to live forever. <coughs> because even his mortality, his ability on earth, he will be cast into the lake of fire. Okay? So he has to live forever and he has to ascend his throne above God. 
So he has to become God and he has to live forever. One of the things they're trying to do is create what's called transhumanism. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting ready to cough. Give me just a moment. Okay. One of the things that they're attempting to do in an effort called what's what's called transhumanism is they are attempting to merge computers with humans. Okay? 666, two-thirds of a man. We'll get to that. But they're looking at doing, taking the thoughts and the memories and the person, the person that's up here, which when you get into my other studies later on, when you look, we look at Maslow's hierarchy and how we're created, we'll see that the soul of man is a little different than what people say. Our soul is given to us. But our soul is really based upon what happens to us. In other words, we have a physical body and we have a mind to perceive our physical world. Okay? And what happens within those two go together to create our soul. It's our hard drive. It's our, our uh, experiences. It's a combination of who we are. It's what creates, our, it's what creates who we are. Okay? Now, without the spirit of God protecting our soul... We can see a whole kinds of things without filtering through the spirit, but that's a whole other thing. My puppy came in here. Okay, so <clears throat> what they're trying to do is merge computer technology, hard drive, if you will, so that they can download your soul into a hard drive. I know that sounds crazy. I know that sounds totally. Star trek -y and and all this stuff, I get it. But folks, it's what's happening. Okay? The transhumanist movement is merging man and computers. The singularity. We will all be a singularity inside a system. That's this mark of the beast system. You won't be able to buy or sell. You won't be able to do this or do that unless you take this mark, unless you become part of that singularity. It's crazy. I get it. But folks, it's developing before our eyes. But see, the Christians aren't going to go along with this. Why? Because we know the truth. So they have to battle against Christianity, against messages like this, because if this steps out, they won't succeed. We're not taking that mark. We're not attaching ourselves to computers. Yes, I have a credit card in my pocket. Yes, I have a debit card in my pocket. That's as far as I'm going. You're not putting anything in this body that's going to genetically modify me or connect me to a singularity. And folks, that's what we're dealing with. We're going to get to that in a second. But they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So the dragon is giving power unto this beast system, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? So we have a war going on with this beast. Okay, that's the first beast. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue for forty-two months. That is interesting. 42 months. Three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So we can see that there's going to be three and a half years of this individual that's going to be speaking against God against the Christian church. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints going after the Christians, the true Christians, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all the kindreds and tongues and nations. So we see that this individual is also going to be a world ruler at some point. How that exact is exactly going to look, I don't know. Um, but we can clearly see that this is going to be some type of a governmental control. 
<clears throat> global governmental control. And they and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are what? Are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So you see that beast. You see what's going on with the first beast. And I beheld, and another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a what? Like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. Okay? And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth which there dwell in to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Okay, so the second beast is similar or in cahoots with the first beast. I like that word. And he doeth great wonders, so he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So he's showing fire come down from heaven. Is that missiles? Is that whatever? We don't know. But he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. What's the problem? Deception. That dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause at that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation 5, under the altar, image of the beast being killed, <clears throat> slain for the word of God. Okay, here's the tricky part. We are told, as Christians, make no graven images, not of wood, not of anything. We are not to have an image of a beast. Now, when you pull this up and you go back to Romans 123, it says, This is Paul speaking, and the glory, and they changed. Let's go back to God's wrath on unrighteousness. Let's just go all the way to Romans. This is Paul speaking. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold truth in unrighteousness. Okay, that's a false truth. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. We've already talked about that. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Look at the trees, look at the flowers, look at look at everything. This is a created world. This thing didn't happen by circumstance. This isn't lightning striking a pool, says pool of molecules and turning it into life. You have a soul, you have a being, you are a being, you are created. Let's go look at it this way. God says that everything will reproduce after its kind. Evolution says that we started out as this little one-celled animal and everything came forth from that. Well, let me ask you this. Which is more complicated as far as reproduction is concerned? A one-celled animal who asexually divides and reproduces? Or sexual reproduction, which actually takes a male and a female of the same kind to reproduce? Okay, so if you go from the simple to the complex, that totally violates scientific law. The laws of thermodynamics says anything less left unto itself will go from a state of higher order to lower order. That's the law of decay. Things decay. Things don't progress forward. Okay, and that's what creation shows us. But we also know that back during, and scripturally speaking, back during before the flood, people lived 800, 900, 1,000 years. God says that man's time would be 120 years. Now we're down to 70 and 80 years. Our longevity is decaying, not getting longer. And that is because of the creation is winding 
down until God redeems the earth, replenishes it, and moves us back to a state of immortality like we were created to be. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it unto him. I'm not showing it to you. God is. Go look at a flower. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And then we can go on into what happened. But here's what I'm getting at. <clears throat> We don't worship God as a creator. If we change the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, do we have an image of corruptible man connected with Christianity? Ouch. God said, make no graven image. But I guarantee you, if I say the word Jesus, if you're a professing Christian, if I say the word Jesus and you close your eyes, you have a picture in your head. I know I do. But is that an image of corruptible man? That's the question. And we know historically that they've made images to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. All of the false religions have idols. This is the idolatry. Well, does an image of man, is that also idolatry? The Old Testament tells us that they made images of wood. They made images and they made idols. They made even, even of wood that they neither speak nor talk nor do anything. Do we have an image of wood that we worship? Is that cross, just like on the picture behind me, that I have in my room? Is it the cross that we're worshiping, or is it what took place at the cross? You've got to separate that in your heart, okay? You've got to look at that. We can't go around saying, I've got a crucifix. Get away from me, devil. It has nothing to do with that. That, that in itself is an idol, and you get laughed at because it has nothing to do with that. It is all in spirit who worship God in truth and in spirit. We don't need idols. We don't need holy water. Those are, that's idolatry. And they change the corruptible, the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So we have turned God into this is hard. Jesus. We say Jesus is God. No, Jesus we've clearly seen is the Son of God but we've made God into an image of corruptible man. Not God's son, God's redeeming son, God's redeeming qualities. Very fine line. But that's why all religions lead to the same God. We've just got Jesus and we've got Buddha and we've got Krishna and we've got this and that and that. That's how the world twists religion. That's the religious view. So, that's what Paul is warning us about. So, in Revelation 13, 14, we see this again. And he exercises all power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Okay? That's the first beast. The second beast. Okay. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven and on earth in the sight of men. So a very dear friend of mine the other day um, 
preaching in tongues and calling down fire from heaven. We're going to defeat the Antichrist with the truth of the word. We don't have to call fire down from heaven. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, is that a prophetic thing coming in the future? Okay, possibly we may see a second fulfillment of that, just like in the beginning. But let me ask you this. Do we know of an image that had a wound by the sword and did live? Did prophecy of Jesus on the cross being crucified, the last thing the Romans did when they crucified him was they pierced him with their spear. He had a wound by the sword, if you want to look at it that way. He had an image to the beast which had a wound by the sword and did live. And we're talking about a false image. I'm not denying Christ. I'm not denying that he was his crucifixion and his resurrection. I'm not denying that. I'm saying what where are we now? What how far astray, as in the letters to the seven churches, how far have we gone away from our first love in the original gospel? Because we know we're dealing with deception. See this. Okay? And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So, if you're not going to worship this image, you will be killed. What happened in the Inquisitions? What happened to the martyrs of Jesus during the, before in the, you know, the apostles? All the martyrs of Jesus? all the ones who were following the true Christ, who wouldn't worship a false image. That's what we're looking at in the past. Okay, All of these things have happened. If you're not going to worship the image, you're going to be killed. Now, again, can this be a future fulfillment? Sure. We may see this happening again. But, I believe it's I believe if it is a future fulfillment, it'll be more literal, and it will be after the true church has left. Now, he calls us. What, what is the result of this? If you're not going to worship the first beast, okay, if you're not going to worship the image of the beast, you're going to be killed. Okay? Because we've got to get you out of here because you're not going along with the global government. And he, what was it? He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. Okay? Deadly wound was healed image of the sword and did live. Is this a false Christ, a false image of Christ from the beginning that come out of a church that if you didn't worship the image of that beast, that false Christ, that you would be killed? That's happened. And we will probably see it again. Because that's what they're already talking about. If you're not going to go along with this new world order, yeah, I said it, you need to go. But it's okay. The Christians are out of here anyway. The true Christians. And he causeth all both, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And the result of that is that no man may buy or sell unless he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. There is a number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. All right. We conquered that. So we can see that part of this may be prophetic, but yet this is happening over and over and over again. So I'm going to hit the pause button here, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to dive into this 600, 3 score, and 6, and we're going to see where, see where this leads. Okay, let me check and make sure I'm rolling here, folks. 
hope you're still with me. I know this is uh, I know this is tough, but uh, we've got to get through this. Six hundred three score and six, and everybody. This has plagued everybody for years. Well, is it the chip? Is it the mark? Uh, what is it that's 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 going to indicate the mark of the beast? Um, you know, everybody wants to know what this is. What is it going to be that's going to be revealed? And and you're going to have to study this yourself, as I said. So, but I'm going to take you down a rabbit trail here that's going to blow your mind. It blew mine. It really gave me a heavy heart until I remade this video and then and then come back and did this because I'm leading up to it. Um, but this is going to upset many of you because many of you. Um, may have already made this this decision that's neither here nor there yet um, but we're gonna take a look so we're gonna follow this three score six hundred three score and six 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 the number of a man now there's a thing called gematria or gematria gematria and what it does is it applies a number to a letter you know much like we'd say a is one b is two c is three and in out throughout Hebrew and Greek they apply numbers to letters. So one theory is that well you got to take this and um, you know spell out the person's name and then apply these letters to it and see what it adds up to and it should come up to 666. Mm -hmm. Well you can do that with a number of different things and people have done in the past and that's how it comes up. But you know if that's not in scripture I'm not saying that's not a tool that maybe can or cannot be used but it's not what we're dealing with here. We want to know what Scripture says. We want to know what the Bible says. And we'll put that over there in the extracurricular stuff. But this is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. Okay. So, in my ability, not ability, in my desire to chase rabbits down rabbit trails, I like to find out what words mean. And sometimes this is a code, as I mentioned with that word bow earlier. When you look up the word bow, you get a whole different meaning of what's going on. So I decided to apply that to this 603 score and 6. So what I did is I went up here and turned on my King James Version. You know, with, turned on my concordance. And I went over here, 603 score and 6. And this is all set up to be, it's like a phrase. And let's see what it says. When you click on this, and I've got this all written right here, but I just want to show you. It says right here that this is chi, and I believe that is xi, and stigma. Those are three Greek words. Chi, um, Greek, xi, and stigma. So chi is the 22nd letter, okay, uh, which kind of looks like that X right there. Xi, if that's the way that's pronounced, that's the 14th letter. And an obsolete letter, which looks like a cross. Is that by chance? Why is it obsolete, and why does it look like a cross? Remember I said, is our cross, is our crucifix, can it possibly be an idol? Or can it be a symbol of the number of man? You know, we're not supposed to make any graven images. This deception, this alphabet, this letter has been removed. Why? Because does this letter, 666, end in a symbol of man? Now here's something else, too. The Greek alphabet, it's an, it's an intermediate between the fifth and the sixth when used as numbers, denoting respectively 660 and then 6 with a colon and a 666. So does that mean two-thirds? I mean, it's between 5 and 6. So is it, you know, 6 is the number of man. But this cross says is in between. It's not quite man. So is it part... Is it part man and not man? 
like I said earlier, humanism being part computer, part cyborg, part genetically modified, as in Genesis 6, which we didn't get into. But Genesis 6, when we look at that, hey baby, when we look at Genesis 6, we see that the sons of God found the daughters of men that they were fair, took for them wives of all of whom they chose. Those became the mighty men, the men of renown. Those were the giants. That was the reason for the flood. It was a genetic manipulation that took place. And God said all flesh had corrupted itself. So Genesis 6 that brought about the destruction was a genetic manipulation. As I said, Satan's plan is to try and live forever. So if that's what this means here, that is an intermediate number between 5th and 6th, and 6 is the number of man, that means it's not quite human. And it's denoted by a cross. That can take you down some serious rabbit holes. Okay? But, okay, am I reading too much into this? We're going to have to find out. So, that's what that means there. But notice it says up here at the top, it says it is from an obsolete letter of G4742. So, I'm going to look up, and this is what I did over here on this side. Um, and that word is stigma. Let's see. I'm going to do this for you. Commentary. Bible. Dictionary. Search. Stigma. Oops, sorry. Stigma. Okay. Is that what it said right here? Here's 40, here's G4742. That's what this said right there, right? Let me do it this way. Well, there it is. Kai Zai Stigma, 5516, 5516. It's at the 22nd, 14th, an opposite letter. That's that definition. And it's from 4742. Okay, which I'm going to pull this up here. So there's 4742, stigma, from a primary word, stizo, which means, I'm going to hate this, to stick. That is to prick. A mark incised or punched for recognition of ownership. That is figuratively a scar of service or a mark. Folks, do we see what's happening here? Now, I'm not saying what just happened is the mark of the beast, but I will say this. Genesis 6, it was all about the genetic modification of man and, and Satan's attempt to live forever. Satan's plan to destroy humanity. You see what I'm saying? It says his number is 666, which means he's not quite human. That be the case, you be the judge. And the whole word, word stigma is a cross which is hidden as an obsolete word. And stigma means uh, to stick, that is to prick, to incise or be punched for recognition of ownership. Telling you who you belong to. Think about that. Jesus says that before destruction comes, that he will seal the servants of God in their forehead. We will get a mark upon our right hand or upon our forehead. Now, in times past, and to all of my Catholic friends out there, I love you. It's not about that. But Lent, if you go to the book of um, Ezekiel, you'll see that the women sat on the steps of the altar of the temple. They had their backs to the temple, and they were weeping for Tammuz. If you look up Tammuz, you will see that there's 40 days of worship. 
for Tammuz. That lays right alongside the 40 days of Lent. Remember, this Antichrist is going to look like Christ. So I'm not judging you, but I'm asking you to back up and go, wait a minute. Okay? What do you do at Lent? You put ashes on your forehead in the sign of a cross, in the sign of a stigma, or you put it on your hand. Folks, I can't, I'm not making this up. We see it in our world today. I love you, and I know I may end up under the altar, but this has got to be told. This is how close the deceptive line is in our world today. You have to make the decision on what you're going to do. Now let's get back to this primary word to stick, that is to prick. Is this another type of mark? Is this another fulfillment of that? Because not only did we first, you know, do it this way, you know, now we're doing it this way. Okay? Because you are making a choice of what you're going to follow. And you're doing that because of fear. Fear of death. Okay? We don't want to die. I get that. We all have still have that fear of death, even in our mortality. But death, where is thy sting? We know we have a better life going forward. And this is the decisions we're making. And this is hard because most of my family have done this. And that hurts. And I don't know that this is what this is, but it's, it, it's possible. All I know is that this particular stick, this particular situation, was pulled out into the world, was brought out into the world, because of fear of a pestilence, of a pandemic, of death. Remember we saw all of those things in the book of Revelation? All of, of how the horsemen come out? Okay? And so that brought about the fear. And people reacted and responded to that fear. And they took a prick. Now remember I told you in Genesis 6 that the goal of the Antichrist, or it wasn't an Antichrist back then, but the goal of Satan back then was to genetically modify creation. And that's what happened. It was an abomination. Okay? That's where we got dinosaurs. That's where we got all that stuff. It was, it was manipulation by higher powers. Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spirits, upon rulers upon high places. Okay? We're the prize. That's what happened to us before the flood. That's what's going to happen to us again. Why? Because Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. How was it in the days of Noah? Humans were genetically modified and became an abomination to what was his original created intent. That's the days of Noah. Now, People are afraid of this, of, of getting sick. People are afraid of this, this worldly situation going on here. I get it. But you've got to have the truth in you. And you can repent. I fully believe you can repent of this. I don't think it's too late. That's between you and God. But this particular um, treatment if you will, is different than any other treatment for communicable diseases in the past. Most of those things happened because you were given a dead virus, your body saw the dead virus, and your body produced an immune response. So that when the live virus ever got in there, your body would be prepared to take over. That's how those previous concoctions worked. Okay? Those are fine. I've had those. I think we give too many of them uh, at at one time that little babies' bodies can't handle it. That's why we have increases. I'm not completely anti 
the V word. Um, but this particular one works completely different. Okay, it takes the code of this supposed threat and it mimics that code and it goes into your cell and it creates and modifies and puts a little spike protein. Okay, that is a genetic modification, that is a genetic manipulation. That is exactly what happened in Genesis 6. Possibly. The beginnings of what may have happened in Genesis 6. It's a precursor or, a, or an example. may not be exact. Because I don't know what happened exactly in Genesis 6. I just see the bigger picture. So what's going to happen here going forward? I don't know. But you can already see, as you watch our things that are happening in our Mockingbird media, that you're going to have to have a pass that if you don't take this, you're not going to be able to buy, you're not going to be able to sell, you're not going to be able to fly on a plane, you're not going to be able to do all of these things. So that is a direct result of not succumbing to or following this process. Is that scripture or not? Is that not scripture? And when I saw this, I'm like, are we serious? And we do have a portion of the church out there promoting this. Oh, you, you've got to, you've got to go do this. You've got to, you know, you've got to. As a church, we're responsible to to set a good example and to set this. And but you don't have the spirit of truth in you. And I know that's harsh, but uh, you've got to make a choice. For you and your flock and you and your congregation, should that be the case. Okay, I kind of had to come in and edit this part in because I left a couple of things out uh, before we get to <laughs> the next section. So I just wanted to add this in here because we're all talking about choice. We're going to have to make a choice. And I think that choice is more important as a mark than any physical evidence that's going to be more of the tool but you're gonna to have to make the choice before you accept the mark so that's really the important part um, that we have to get to so I want to go to here go back to Revelation 13 18 and it says here is wisdom <clears throat> let him let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is 603 score and 6. Now, we're all, many people have looked at that and said, well, it's the number of a man. Well, let's read that again. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. So it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So, yes, it's a man, but yes, it is a presentation or a number that represents the man. Okay, and we see that also if you go up a verse, it says, and that no man may buy or sell save he that had the mark of the beast, excuse me, the mark, or the number of the beast, or the number of his name. So there's three different things that are connected to this number. So in 13.18 it says, let us, he who has wisdom, let him hath understanding, count, this is what you have to do to figure it out, the number. Okay, well let's look at, obviously you realize now I love using this concordance, what does the word count mean? And so we can go right here, 55.85, and it says to use pebbles in enumeration, that is to compute or to count, okay? <laughs> One apple, two apple, three apple, four apple, we get it. Okay, not too hard, but I like digging a little deeper. And that's where it says it's from G5586. So we need to pull up, go back to our dictionary, hit search, type in the word count. And what did, what did it say? Count is 5585. That's how it's used. There's 5585. Let's click on that. And where it says from G5586, 
to use pebbles in enumeration that is case sensitive to compute or to count. Simple enough. But it's from the word uh, safos, from the same as 5584, which is a pebble worn smooth by handling, that is, by implication, here we go, of use as a counter or a ballot, a verdict of acquittal, or a ticket of admission. It's a vote. That's the bigger definition of what's going on here. So what did we choose? What did we vote? What did we count? When we're counting the number of this man. Interesting to say the least, right? So it also says there that it's from 5584. And 5585, five, oh, okay, that's the definition, so 5584. Five, so that's 5586. Five, this is 5585, 5586, five, five, which is also from 5584. Five, so let's see what, see if I can pull up 5584. Five, and I'm going to read. So this is Faithos again, which we just saw. This is 5586, five, which we just saw. This is 5585, five, five, went to 5586. Five, five, so here we are, 5584. Five, and it's a pebble worn smooth by handling, that is implication. But 5584 five, says, from the base of or compared to manipulate, that is verify by contact figuratively or search for, to feel after, to handle, or to touch. So are you getting a picture of that word count? We've got the picture of the word vote. We've got the picture of the word manipulate. we got the picture of the word choice. we got the picture of the word election. You're going to choose. I'm not necessarily talking politically here, though we can tiptoe into that, but that's not my focus right now. But we can see that counting is a process of balloting or choosing or counting. And then we're going to look at, I mean, that's, that in itself is eye-opening. So next, let's look at the word number. The word number comes from the word arithmos. Okay, simple enough. That's where we get the word arithmetic. And it is from G142. Okay. So we need to look up what G142 is. So let me pull my dictionary back up. I shouldn't have closed it. We're going to type in the word number. And we can see it's all different places and different ways that the word number is used. But in this case, it's G, um, number is G706. So we'll go down to the Greek. And it's 706. Right there. So we'll click on 706. And there it is, Arithmos from G142, which is a number, as reckoned up, a number. Okay, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. But 142 says, it's a primary verb, which means to lift by implication, to take up or take away. Figuratively, to raise, as in raise the voice, to keep in suspense of the mind, specifically to sell away, that is to weigh anchor, and I'm not so sure how that fits. Or in the Hebraic, or the Hebraism, it's compared to uh, Hebrews 53.75, which is to expiate sin, or a way, bear up, carry, lift, loose, make, make to doubt. That's the word I'm looking for. Make to doubt, to put away, to remove, or to take away up. Okay. So we're going to look at 5375 here in the Hebrew, maybe. Fifty-three seventy-five. Well, if we click on that, it's a primitive root, which means to lift in a great variety of applications, literatively and figuratively absolutely and relatively to accept, advance, arise, to be able, to suffer, to bear, to bring forth, to burn, to carry, 
to cast, to contain, to ease, exalt, exalt yourself, can be forgive, okay? So this whole word number, well this is the word Yahishra, ya is where that comes from. This, come, this word comes from payment of a contract. Concretely, salary, fair, maintenance by implication, compensation, benefit, hire, price, and reward. So, counting means to vote, or to count, or to choose the number, which we got all kind of stuff from that. I like the, using the G142 because it's the closest, which means a primary word to keep in suspense. What is that? What is the, keeping something in suspense, especially your mind? That means you're, that's a deceptive practice. So you're going to vote for the deceptiveness of the beast. I know I'm stretching there a little bit. I'm trying to paint a picture of what that could could mean when we look at those things. And some of this has to unfold. We have to be able to see what's going on. So I'm not going to say thus saith the Lord, but that word counting there is choice. It's not gematria. It's count the number. You're going to choose His ways to lift by implication, to take up or away, figuratively to raise your voice. You're going to speak, you're going to raise your voice in opposition or in uh, acceptance of that number of the man. Very interesting. Okay, so with that, that's what I wanted to add in here. So we're going to move on to the next part and we're going to tie that into the word uh, in, the, in the next section. Now, so we see that. Let's go to Revelation 18.23. We see how this actually takes place. Revelation 18.23, and I'm about to wrap this up. Okay. This is the fall of Babylon. Now I have said in some of my other videos that I believe Revelation, where you have the beast and you have Babylon, is you have the battle of two separate beast systems. Okay? You have a dragon. Okay? You have a dragon who wants to create a one world government, a governmental control, okay? That's that antichrist spirit who wants to rule the world, okay? That's the other plan of Satan. Live forever, have dominion over the world, and be God. Those three things. That's his that's his plan. Then there's also Babylon. And I mentioned that earlier with that harlot, okay? Babylon is known as the great center of commerce. Okay, in ancient days, Babylon was a great city. It's Mesopotamia. It's where, we, where it's actually it's called the Cradle of Civilization. Uh, they had the Hanging Gardens, and it was a very wonderful place as a city, supposedly. And Revelation 18.1 says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and every cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So we can see that this is how the rich men, the mighty men, the captains, have all waxed wealthy by following the Babylonian, this Babylon system. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, 
Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and receive not of her plagues. So you see, God is calling my people out of this worldly system. Okay, Be not partaker of her sins. If you take this mark, if you want to be able to buy or sell or do these things, see, you're being called out of that. Okay, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her work in the cup which she hath filled, fill it, filled to her double. How she has glorified herself. Remember, glorification of self. Uh, that's one of the things that, that Satan says. That's the trick. You know, false gospels, false teachers edify the self. You're God. You're, you're, you're made in the image of God. I'm God. No, I'm a son of God. I have a different place. I am not God. Okay? That's very, very, very important. Okay? You glorify yourself, you are following the plan of Satan. And that doesn't mean you have to live defeated either. You know, I'm just a poor, poor sinner. No, you're not. If you're saved, you're a child of God. Put yourself in perspective. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. That's a church. Dude, is that the Vatican? The Vatican has all pretty much all the money in the world. It's the global control mechanism. How much torment and sorrow give her, for she has said in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and I shall see no sorrow. Now, Mary is known as the queen of heaven. That's what they profess. I've seen so many Catholic doctrines that, you know, Mary's the queen of heaven. If you go back to the original churches, Mary was not considered a queen of heaven. That did not happen until after Constantine, where they adopted Mary. If you go to the letters of the seven churches and you look at the church of Ephesus, Ephesus worshipped Diana. Okay, Diana was a queen of heaven. She is the mother goddess, the mother goddess of fertility, who is represented by eggs. That's the mythology. Are we are we button up next to that? Okay, are we getting the Queen of Heaven mixed up with Mary, the mother of the mother of Christ? Are we are we meshing those two? Okay, that's what we have to be able to sit. And I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and I shall see no sorrow. So one that's one representation of it. Another representation of that is this, Babylon being the economic center of the world. And I chased another rabbit hole, and I chased it down through the Queen of England. And Queen Elizabeth was crowned when she was like 27 years old when her father died, and her uncle had vacated the throne. It was supposed to have been passed down to him, but he wanted to marry someone outside of whatever, so the throne was given to her, but she was the next in line for the heir, but she wasn't married. So she became a queen, but she is no widow. Well, London is the head of the global economic center of the world. A lot of people think that's New York, and I believe New York is attached to it, but London is actually the economic center of the world. That's where you get your your Rothschilds, your oligarchs, your uh, international monetary funds, your global banking systems. This is where you get this Babylonian capitalist system. So we have a picture of a communist globalist system that wants to be run by a dragon and a picture of Babylon that wants to be run by uh, the rich men and the mighty men. Can we see that picture? But both are going to lead to destruction. Why? Because we're not of this world. We're not of these two systems. Okay? So how much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously, and so much torment and sorrow give her. So we've got a queen of heaven 
writing this Babylonian system. Therefore her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall utterly be burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, say, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth shall sweep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. For the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet, and wood and all manner of vessels and ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and brass and iron. This is the collapse of the economic system. And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, slaves, and souls of men. Souls of men taken captive by the Babylonian system. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more. And the merchants of these things, which were made by rich by her, shall stand afar off for fear of the torment, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors and many as trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, What city like unto this great city? And they cast dust upon their heads and cried weeping and wailing, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich, that all the ships in the sea by reason of her costliness for in one hour is made desolate. But rejoice over her, thou heaven, ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. <laughs> Boom. End of story. End of Babylon. And the voice of the harpers and the musicians and the pipers and the trumpets shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman or whatsoever, whosoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Okay, The voice of the bride and the bridegroom, that's Christ and the bridegroom. So... At the fall of Babylon may also be, Revelation may overlap here. And that when this voice, when the wrath of the Lamb occurred, as we spoke to earlier, this may also be when Babylon falls in one hour. Because we say that we all shall not perish, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So all this is going to happen very rapidly. And there will be no more bridegroom. Okay, for thy merchants were the nate great men. This is key. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. Hear that? The great men, the mighty men, hid themselves in the rocks and the dens for the for the wrath of the Lamb has come. And for by thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all that were slain upon the earth. Slain for the word of God. Those that are under the altar. Those that have taken and put in their own lives on the line for the word of truth and for the word of God. All the nations were deceived. Okay, Jesus said, go and preach the truth. Go and preach the gospel into all the nations. So see, it's not a racial issue. It's not a white, brown, red, black. It's none of that. It's who wants to believe the truth. Do you see this? Do you see the importance of this? Now let me share one more depth with you. I'm just about to wrap things up. 
sorceries were all the nations deceived. Remember, my theory here, my, my, my thought to you is deception is the problem, not your sin. Yes, we all have sin, but deception is the problem because we get rid of our sin through Jesus Christ. You see that? We've got to go to Him to be healed and to be cleansed. So were the all nations deceived. How? By sorceries. Oh, you're going to love this. The word sorcery. I, sweetie, hold on. The word sorcery. Right here. G5331. You're not going to like it. Let me click on it so I can get it to stay. Comes from the Greek word pharmakia, from the word which means medication or pharmacy. That's where we get our drugs, that's where we get our pharmaceutical industry. How wealthy are the rich men of the pharmaceutical industry? People who need insulin, okay, in order to live. You know, they're charged $400, yet you can go get needles for a drug exchange for free if you'll put these poisons in your body. Does it make sense to you now why that why that's like that? Because they want to take the good people and keep them and 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 use it against them. And the the ones who are struggling who are already sick, well they just let them go ahead and kill themselves. Let them go let them go ahead and destroy themselves. Okay? Now, I'm not saying all medication is bad. But look at the battle within that medical field. What are you going to choose? By their sorceries, all the nations were deceived. Medication, pharmacy, that is an extension of magic, sorcery, witchcraft. Delivered to people by a mark, the word stigma, that is an obsolete letter that looks like a cross that comes in the form of a pinprick or a stick that's going to genetically modify and change you? You personally have to seek this out. But this is, this is, this is where we're at. So the question becomes, is there anything going on in our world today involving a prick or a stick or an incised punch that is by nature pharmakia and indicates who you belong to? And does it indicate if you'll be soon be able to buy or sell or do these things? And is it promoted to you because you fear death? and the white horses, and the other horses, and the famines, and those things. Folks, I can't make this stuff up. You have, if you're still with me, you have just followed me from, from Genesis to how man was created in the image of God. That breath of life was breathed into Adam. Adam was a son of God. And I've got a whole teaching on this. It's like three hours long. Unto Jesus, who is a begotten Son of God, who was purposely given to us to show us the way out and to give us the Spirit and the knowledge of who God is so that we can be redeemed and saved from what's coming. You have to educate yourself on Scripture. This didn't happen with me overnight. It took... 20 years. But this is the world we're living in. This is You're seeing the battle of the one beast, the Babylonian beast, and you're seeing the battle of a global government beast. But that's not our kingdom, and I'm going to show you our kingdom here in just a minute. But first, I want to, I want to, I want to back you up here to to the first kingdom. I want to back you up to the kingdoms a little while. Oops. It's not what I needed. Hmm. 
I lost my search. I wasn't going to go here, but I need to back up and show you this. My search button. Back in Revelation, where it's talking about the beast, and it's identifying the beast. This is a little more speculative, but it still paints the picture. I'm just got to find this. I'm going to pause this just a second until I pull this up. Okay, I had to go back and pull this back up because I wanted to take and show you something else. Back in Revelation 17, when we were talking about the different kingdoms that have come, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Now remember, this is John, in the book of Revelation, writing this during about 90 A.D. So the kingdom that is would be the Roman Empire. The prior kingdoms is what you see in Daniel 9, with the vision of da that Daniel had uh, where it showed the head of gold and the breastplate of silver um, brass and then iron mixed with clay and that iron mixed with clay is the two systems two systems living together but they're not mixing okay and then the feet of that is, is what it stood on because it goes from the legs down to the iron but that's not where I want to focus on it says, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. Okay, and when he cometh, he must continue but a short space. Okay, so five are fallen, and one is, so that's six. So the seventh, the seventh, and is not, even he, okay. There are seven, seven kings. Five are fallen and one is. So six, Roman is six. The other is not yet come. Okay, so this is a future. But when he come, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh that goeth into perdition. So I got to thinking, the way the Bible reads and the way the Bible is such a code, and we're talking about the dragon and how this serpent is and that he must continue but a short space and that the eighth is of the seventh. Well, it got me looking because there's a lot of speculation on, you know, well, the sixth is Rome and the seventh was Hitler and then the eighth is going to be the fourth Reich, which comes out of Hitler. Um, wow. Wow. So if Hitler is the seventh, he is the third Reich, looking at this from a Reich standpoint. And you can take, okay, we're just going to do this. Let's go look at, we're going to come back and look at that because I've already got this other pulled up. And he goes into perdition. But then we've got another version that says he must continue a short space. So I'm going to, I'm going to double this, show you two prophetic things right here. Well, I got to look, and I'm like, okay, an empire that's going to continue, or a kingdom that's going to continue but a short space, that's the seventh, and is also the eighth, and is also the dragon. So I asked, I just went over here, and I was looking at Constantine, how long was Constantine emperor, because I was looking, trying to figure out if that was Constantine, and he had a fairly lengthy rule, 306 to 337. Um... But I scrolled on down and I said, okay, what was the largest empire ever? Which empire lasted for the shortest period of time? You ready? The empire of China was the shortest empire in human history. Formed on the 12th of December, 1915, which is World War I, that time frame, after the collapse of the... Qing Dynasty and ended on March 22nd, uh, 1916. So really, it was only 
a dynasty or an empire from December of 1915 to March of 1916, which is four months. Not 42 months like I'd like to see, but four months. Okay? So, if this seventh empire must only be for a short period of time, and the eighth is of the seventh, so the eighth then is the dragon coming out of China. That's what I see. That's what I see. Now, let's look at something else. The other version is that Hitler was that Third Reich, and he was the Antichrist, and he was this, and he was that. Okay, so if Hitler was the Third Reich, what was the First Reich? So I typed in the word First Reich, and let's click that, and lo and behold, the Holy Roman Empire. He defined the Holy Roman Empire 800 to 1806 as the First Reich. And the German Empire from 1871 to 1918, okay, what did we see here? 1915 to 1916. Okay, and the German Reich 1871 to 1918 as the Second Reich. While the Third Reich was an ideal state including all German peoples including Austria in the modern context the term refers to Nazi Germany those aren't my words that's here so the first Reich ended in 1806 the second Reich began in 1871 ended in 1918 which also coincides with the power of the seventh beast or the seventh dragon of the short while okay so we've got that one coming out and now we've got the Holy Roman Empire which again nothing against the Catholic people but we see it right here being the scarlet, being the whore of Babylon, riding the beast of Babylon. So, let me, let me go back to here. You cannot make this stuff up. Revelation 17, 15. Oh, I'm getting ready to get to there. Okay. And thou sawest... Uh, okay, back up here. In the mystery of... And I will tell thee. Whoops. i go up here. The great prostitute, prostitute and the beast. This is that relationship. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talk with me, saying, Come and hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So we just talked about the destruction of Babylon, right? And now we're going to talk about the whore of Babylon, the destruction of the woman, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having the seven heads and ten horns. Okay? And this is the Babylonian system. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and the filthiness of their fornications. And upon her forehead was written, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. This is Babylon. And I saw the woman, drunken with what? The blood of the saints 
and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did thou marvel? Why do you marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carried her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, that is to go into sin. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And when they behold the beast that was and is not, yet is. So if your name is not written in the book of life, if you're not given in to the authority of Jesus Christ, if you're not accepting of the Holy Spirit and want to see the truth and are after and seeking that truth, you're going to be led astray into following after the world. That's not me saying this. And here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, that's been portrayed as the Vatican, the city of Rome, the city on seven hills. It's also been looked at at the pillars of society, the economic system, uh, the farming system, the merchant system that we looked at earlier. Okay, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh that go into perdition. Remember we looked at the dragon, that seventh kingdom that was the shortest kingdom. If we want to follow that, and we can see that the eighth is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. Okay, And the ten horns which thou sawest are the ten kings which receive no kingdoms as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. That's one hour which in this case, if we're calling this beast, okay, these have one mind and give their power and strength unto the beast, and they shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb what shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, and they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. Okay, that's at the end. Okay, and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are the people and the multitudes, and the nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which shall saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate, and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. What did we just see? The destruction of Babylon. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the word of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That is the prostitute. That is the false prophet. That is the queen of heaven. That who sits a queen and is no widow. And after I saw these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having the great power and earth was lightened by his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through their abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she has fulfilled. For how much has she glorified herself, and lived deliciously? So much torment, so much sorrow give her. For she has said in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord of God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the torment 
saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon is fallen. And we've already read this part. So this is the fall of the Babylonian system at the hand of the dragon. You've got these two things working hand in hand. So do we see right now in our society a system, a global government system, desiring to take away our current Babylonian economic system? Yes, we do. This is what's happening in our world right now as we speak from all different perspectives. Folks, it's in front of your eyes. Believe it or not. But this is what we're dealing with. Oh, but there's so much more to come. So much more to come. Revelation 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hands. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Hallelujah, Amen, and Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, ye that fear him, both small and great. And this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of the mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not scarlet and purple, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they that call unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And they said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and for thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You see the difference. Worship God. Jesus is the Son. We become the Son. Jesus is not God. Jesus never says, worship me. Worship Him as the Son. That's, what, that's the message Jesus is giving us. Be the Son of God. Don't be God. Don't make yourself God. That's the false religion. Make yourself the Son of God. And then there's the rider on the pale horse. Excuse me, the rider on the white horse. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had the name written on them that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth upon the winepress in the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried in a loud voice, saying unto all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. 
that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of the horses, and of them that sit upon them, and the flesh of all the men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him, and the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them, which had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. And both were cast into the lake of fire, burning. Let me read that again. 19, Revelation 19.20 And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet, that wrought the miracles before him, which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire. And the remnant that were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse with the sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. A thousand years. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and the sea, excuse me, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw the thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is the defeat of Satan. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sands of the sea. And they went up in the breadth of the earth, and they compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up their dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up their dead which were in them, and they were all judged, every man, according to their works. These are those without the resurrection. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Because it's not about your works, folks. It's not about your works. And that's it. Then we have a new heaven and a new earth. Remember, in Genesis, I told you, God created the Garden of Eden, a garden of perfection, Okay, Satan deceived 
Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus, through Jesus, God has just brought about the redemption, the redemption of his people and has just cast the element of deception into the lake of fire. So what happens next? The new heaven and the new earth. This is what you have to look forward to. Okay? This is what the world is trying to keep you from understanding. And it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there's no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's all about the bride. It's about the bride of Christ. It's about the bride of Adam. It's about the seed of the woman. It's about those who choose to be here. You will choose. So the bride is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away all their tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all the liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. And there came, this is the new Jerusalem, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the last seven plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Here's the bride. Here's your new home. If you are the bride of Christ, if you choose to follow what I'm explaining to you today, this is what you have to look forward to. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city. City. Well, it was a garden. Now it's a city. We built treasures in heaven. Holy Jerusalem descending down out of heaven from God having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. And it had a great, had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and on the gates were the twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east it had three gates. And on the north it had three gates. And on the south it had three gates. And on the west it had three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. And in them are the names of the twelve apostles. The foundations, the rock, we're building our foundation upon the twelve apostles. The twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, 
And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs, and the length and the breadth of it and the height are equal. It's a physical place. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man. Well, that is of the angel. Because it's the angel that's talking. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was of pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, and the second was sapphire, and the third was chalundy, and the fourth an emerald. The fifth was sardonyx, and the sixth was sardis. The seventh was chrysolite, and the eighth was beryl. The ninth is topaz, the tenth is chrysophorus. I hope I said that right. The eleventh is Jason, and the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every and every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as if it were transparent glass. Remember that sea of glass we allude to. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. That light of Genesis 1 is the light of the Lamb in Revelation 21-23. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. The night is darkness. And they shall bring glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh an abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of their tree were for healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Jesus is coming. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. Remember, he's showing this to John. And he's saying, Jesus is coming. These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto you his servants these things which must shortly be done. Remember that from come up hither. These things I must show you which must shortly be done. It says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth these sayings of the prophecies of this book. And I, John, saw these things, and I heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And then he said unto me, See thou do it not. For I am of thy fellow servants, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, 
Seal not these sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. See, in Daniel, Daniel was told to seal up the books of the prophecy. John is being shown this in 90 AD, saying, Seal not the sayings of this prophecy, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand in 90 AD, not at some point in the future. So seal not the sayings of the prophecies of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. He said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they which do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter through the gate into the city. For without are the dogs, the sorcerers, the whoremongers, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto you, every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Folks, that's how the book ends. That's the destruction of the beast system. That's the destruction of the Babylonian system. That's the destruction of the whore of Babylon. That's the destruction of the false prophets and the false teachers, and the liars, and the whoremongers, and the idolaters, those who live by sorcery, those who work to scheme and to connive, and to create a world that looks like the world that we're in. Many of you out there have said to me, and I've been asked this question, well, if God's God, why is the world in such a bad, you know, bad position? You know, why does God let this sin go on? If he's God, why don't he just fix it? Folks, I just read you the fix. I just read you the fix. There is a time coming where all of this that you see before you will be destroyed. God will fulfill his will. But the goal is you. Where will you be? Do you want to be the bride of Christ or do you want to live like the world? That's where we're at. 
that's the entire book. Now you can go in and fill in gaps and, and, and I can layer upon layer upon layer through here through David and through kingdoms and, and how God brings about redemption of his people over and over and over again until we get to the final redemption. It's a cyclical pattern, but this is the Alpha Omega pattern. Are you going to accept this mark? Are you going to repent of this, of following the world? You know, we have to be in the world. We have to make a living. I get that. But we don't have to live as the world. Okay? My heart is clear. I've, I've walked through this. This has been on my heart for a week now. Our God, our Jesus, is the Alpha and the Omega. If you want to watch my series on the image of man, that's available to you. But Adam was created in the image of God. That breath of life, that light that was created in the beginning was breathed into Adam. Adam became a living soul. That soul was deceived and Adam fell to become what we are as man. Our fallen nature was because of the deception. Sin of man is the result. The cause is the deception. So by revealing the deception, the sin of man can be overcome through Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus Christ had to come in the form of fallen man in the image of man, son of man, and son of God. Because he was not begotten of sinful man, he was begotten of the Father. Through the virgin, he was not begotten by sexual... Remember, God put in a law of kinds. Everything shall reproduce after its kind. Fallen Adam is going to reproduce after his kind. The Spirit of God will reproduce after his kind. That's Jesus. So he was both man and spirit. And when we actually look at what Jesus looks like at the mountain of transfiguration, you will see something completely different. And I can get in, I've got that already done. It's in that image of God video. But uh, this is where we're at, folks. I love you. I pray for you. I judge that you will. I hope that you will test everything that I've said in this video and uh, I hope you will seek it out for yourself but it's because it's all about you and your relationship through the Spirit of God it's all about your redemption it's all about Peter saying you are the Christ the Son of the Living God it's not about Jesus making Peter God it's about Jesus making Peter son of God. Lord, thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving me the words to, to speak this, to produce this. And Lord, may they, all this be done to your glory, to your salvation. I am just a servant. We, all of us, are just servants. May this word go forth and not come back void. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you on the air or in the air.